This video is brought to you by CatBeast.com. Design your own custom snapbacks and hats. What is going on, guys? JD from New York here. Thank you so much for tuning back into the channel tonight as we are set to discuss the first ever Great Balls of Fire pay-per-view presented by WWE. Coming to you from Dallas, Texas, July 9th, 2017. Man, before we even... Before we even tackle the review, I want to thank everybody that came out to the live stream, man. We had close to 1,300 viewers when that thing went off the air, man. Thank you to everybody that joined me on the fun, on the Twitch stream with the live reactions. We're going to do the same thing again this Wednesday for NXT. And then we are going to do the same thing for Battleground 2017, okay? I want to try and incorporate Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, but when I get a proper streaming setup, that's when I'll start doing Raw and SmackDown live reactions with you guys. But right now, keeping it minimized to just NXT and the pay-per-views. But I'm glad you guys are enjoying them, man. They are a blast to do. And I want to thank everybody that came out. I want to thank everybody that followed me on Twitch. And I want to thank everybody that donated to the live stream, man. You guys are absolutely fucking amazing with your support of this channel and this podcast, man. Thank you guys so very much. I want to thank at MikeWill87, as always, for the beautiful layout that you guys are seeing right now and the thumbnail for the pay-per-view. Uh, you guys know him as the main man behind all my layouts and my thumbnails. My stuff would not look half as good as it does if it wasn't for him. I want you guys to go show him support. If you guys need any thumbnails or layouts, at MikeWill87 is your hookup. And he's got some very, very competitive prices, some good prices there. So he will do an amazing job for you like you see here. Whatever you want him to do, he will do it for you. He is that damn good. So make sure you guys go check him out on Twitter. And finally, I got to do a huge shout-out, man. I got to give a huge shout-out to one of my boys, man. One of my subscribers, at Jorel34 on Twitter. Bro, you are a fucking beast. That off-the-script sign in the crowd was fucking phenomenal. And that Roman Reigns fucking flag that you had with his face and the hashtag get off my TV, man. I wanted to see more of that during the match, but um, I understand why you probably could not. I understand why you probably wouldn't want that being taken away from you. Um, but that was amazing, man. If you guys seen that in the crowd, the huge off-the-script logo sign that was shown throughout the, the entire pay-per-view, you had a... He had a front row fucking seat with that, man. It was beautiful to see that thing highlighted with my Twitter handle and the Off The Script logo right there on this first ever Great Balls of Fire pay-per-view. And then that Roman Reigns flag with the hashtag Get Off My TV right underneath Roman's big ugly mug, man. That was fucking beast. If you guys want to go check out Jarrell and send him a thank you for being such a huge supporter of the podcast, at Jarrell34. On Twitter, I will leave you his information down in the comments below. I will pin it at the top of the comments. Make sure you guys go and say thank you to him for being such a loyal goon to the JD Army, man. Thank you guys so very much. Off the Script is live this weekend. Parts 1, 2, and 3. Big weekend of Off the Script. That's live on the channel. If you guys missed any of that, make sure you go check all that stuff out. If you guys want to support the Patreon page, great way to do that, man. And uh, it's just a be the best way to support the show. There's no better way to support the show than Patreon. You guys keep this fucking thing alive in the midst of this YouTube bullshit still going on. That's patreon.com slash JD from NY206. As little as a dollar a month goes a long way. You guys get early access to Off The Script each and every weekend. Exclusive rights to my Discord chat. And if you guys do $3 or more a month, you get access to Off The Script Retro. Make sure you guys go and check that out. That's patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys want to get a free audiobook just for listening to the show tonight, Audible is offering all new listeners of this review a free audiobook and 30 days of Audible service for free. Compatible with both iPhone and Android devices. All you have to do is use our unique link, man. It's audibletrial.com. Slash off the script. Over 180,000 books to choose from, a lot of which are wrestling related. If you guys want to cash in on Daniel Bryan, Shawn Michaels, you got Justin Roberts' new book is up there right now, which a lot of people are listening to right now. And if you guys want to cash in on a pre order, you can even pre order Jim Ross's new book coming out in October. That's audibletrial.com slash off the script. Make sure you guys go and do that. 
All new listeners of this show have an audio book waiting for them for free just for listening and signing up using our link, man. It's once again, audibletrial.com slash off the script. And Barbershop Window, man, I got to thank the people over at Pro Wrestling Tees because I made a mistake like a fucking goon. I made a mistake. They have a huge sale going on on Pro Wrestling Tees right now where you can use the code AMERICA and save 20% off. I thought that spanned all across their websites, including Barbershop Window, where I am, where my merchandise is. It did not. So Ryan, the CEO of Pro Wrestling Tees, hooked me up with my own unique code. And if you guys want anything from my store, and if you guys want any shirts that I offer, all you have to do is go to barbershopwindow.com slash off the script, pick whatever shirt you want, enter the coupon code JD17 at checkout, and you're going to save for a limited time. You're going to save 20% off on any shirt. So if you guys have been thinking about doing a shirt, if you guys have been thinking about getting a shirt ready for SummerSlam, go and do it, man. I don't know how long that code's going to be active, but JD17 at checkout, and you're going to save big money, 20% off on Barbershop Window. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206, and hit that subscribe button down below, and make sure you have the bell turned on for all notifications, man. Thank you guys so very much. Let's talk about Great Balls of Fire, man. Um, you know, I don't want to be too critical. Um, my voice is strained for whatever reason at a long weekend. Um, we did the four-hour Twitch live stream. I don't want to be too critical, and I'm trying to look at everything in the best possible way, okay? The big thing going into the show was Brock Lesnar and Samoa Joe. The buildup has been fantastic. We all kind of knew going into this that Samoa Joe was not going to win the Universal Championship. WWE was not going to have Joe win the title one month before SummerSlam and take that title into Brooklyn. Wasn't going to happen. Okay. They want Lesnar going into SummerSlam, whether their plans are Lesnar Reigns or Lesnar Strowman. We really don't know right now. Okay, I don't even think WWE knows right now. All I wanted to know was that after Joe has been built up so successfully, after Joe has been built up so dominant over the past couple of weeks in this build with Lesnar, all I wanted to know was that Joe was going to come out of this looking better than he has ever looked. Now, some people might agree with me, more so, you guys might disagree with me here, okay? I went back, and before I actually did this review, I watched the match again, being that it was only seven minutes, okay? Joe looked dominant. Joe got his shit in. Joe looked great. Joe took Lesnar to the brink of defeat. The Coquina Clutch... Came in clutch for Samoa Joe. And that's what Joe was going for. They built the story around Brock Lesnar fighting his way out of the Coquina Clutch. And then when Joe finally got the Coquina Clutch in, all Lesnar did was reverse it into one F5 and that was it. My first immediate reaction was disappointment. Just like everybody else. My first immediate reaction was disappointment. But I went back and watched it a second time right before this review. And I realized, you know what? Joe still looked great even if it only took one F5. That was the only thing that I did not like about this match. Was the fact that all it took was one F5 to beat Samoa Joe. I didn't like that at all. And I'm still very iffy on that. But Joe started this match out. Didn't even have the bell ring. He attacked Brock Lesnar while Paul Heyman was introducing Brock Lesnar from behind. He threw him into the barricade. He urinagied him through the announce table on the outside. Lesnar sold like a beast for Joe. And it was a fight. This was a, a, a fucking brawl. It had a big fight feel. Joe was pretty much dominant for most of the seven minutes. Yeah, I know Lesnar is the same shit every fucking time, which is kind of frustrating. You know, all he did was suplex. Lesnar got about, what was it, five or six suplexes on Samoa Joe tonight? And that was it. But outside the five or six suplexes, Brock Lesnar was dominated by Samoa Joe. So you really can't take anything away from this match, except for that one F5. That's a little bit iffy to me. I would not have beat Joe clean 
with one F5. That's where my concern lies. My other thought going into this now with Joe losing and Joe losing clean to one F5, where does that leave Joe? My first thought was like, okay, Joe lost clean. Lesnar's moving on to whomever he's going to fight next at SummerSlam. But with the way the match was laid out and the way Joe looked so dominant, how could you have Joe not ask for a rematch and how could you not grant him a rematch? You know, Lesnar really hasn't been dominated like that very often in his, you know, his WWE run at all. We really haven't seen him dominated whatsoever. So how are you not going to grant Samoa Joe a rematch? I don't see where Joe fits into SummerSlam besides the Universal Championship. And I don't know why they wouldn't grant him a rematch anyway. If you took Lesnar to the brink of defeat like that and you dominated him and you were on the brink of choking him out, I think any right general manager or any right authority figure would grant him another match. Now, Braun Strowman was taken out tonight by Roman Reigns in very physical fashion. The story that was told there is that Strowman might be out for a very long time. I don't know what's going on with that. Roman Reigns lost. Roman Reigns lost the ambulance match to Braun Strowman. So, you got all these pieces, but so many questions. Samoa Joe was the only definitive choice here outside of Strowman and Reigns. Joe was the only definitive choice here based on his performance tonight. So to me, the way I see it, the performance that Joe gave should, and I hope tomorrow on Raw, that he's granted another rematch at SummerSlam with Brock Lesnar. Now, I'm not going to say anything else on that. It was what it was. It was a big fight feel. It had all the makings of a war. It was physical. Joe looked great. Joe looked dominant. He took Lesnar to the brink of defeat. And all it took was one F5. That's where I am like, okay, you know, that's a little bit too much. It's a little bit too much. But Joe looked great in defeat. And it lived up to the brawl that we knew it was going to be. Still seven minutes. I would have had these guys go another six minutes. I would I would have personally liked to see a little bit more wrestling. I would have liked to see a little bit more physicality, you know. But it did have that big fight feel, and Joe did look better coming out of this, even though he lost clean. So I'm just going to leave that as it is. Very good main event. It did what it needed to do. All we can hope for now is Joe gets a rematch based on his performance. Because he did take Brock Lesnar to the brink of defeat, and he needs to be rewarded for that. Now, the ambulance match, everybody thinking this was going to be a number one contenders match, and the winner of this match would fight the winner of the Joe Lesnar match. That wasn't the case. There was reports early on in the day that Vince McMahon was not looking to make this a number one contender match. Their plans are revolving every single day for SummerSlam and WrestleMania. Vince McMahon doesn't even know what he wants to do right now. The last thing that I heard was that Vince McMahon was now pushing for Lesnar and Reigns at SummerSlam, and he was pushing for Lesnar and Strowman at WrestleMania. That was the last thing that I heard, that I read. But again, where does Samoa Joe fit into this? Where does Samoa Joe fit into this? And everything here has the makings, everything that happened tonight with these last two matches has the makings of what I already stated to you guys with a fatal four-way stipulation. It really does. If you look at it, deep down, it has the makings of a fatal four-way SummerSlam main event. Lesnar beat Joe. Lesnar is still the Universal Champion. Joe should be granted a rematch. Now, Strowman is going to come out and say, listen, I walked off on my own. He looked like a fucking beast. He He didn't want any medical attention, bleeding all over the fucking place, leaving a trail of blood wherever he left, and he just walked out on his own with no medical assistance whatsoever. So Strowman is still on his own, on his own two feet, even though he got a fucking huge beating tonight from Roman Reigns in a winning effort. Roman Reigns is going to come out and say, listen, I lost the ambulance match, but I took out Strowman. You know, if there's anybody that deserves a rematch, I'm the one standing tall out of everybody. Joe lost. Strowman is incapable of fucking going one-on-one with anybody right now. I think I deserve a match with Brock Lesnar. But the way it works out is that Reigns has his case, 
Strowman certainly has his case because he did beat Reigns tonight. Joe has his case because he looked dominant in defeat, and he should be granted a rematch based on his performance. He's going to say, listen, I want another shot. I want another shot. Lesnar got lucky. I'm not going to allow this to end on 1F5. Lesnar got lucky. I want a rematch. I want a second chance at Lesnar to show I could beat him. It all has the makings of a fatal four-way. That's what I see coming out of this. And I hope that's what WWE is thinking as well. Because a fatal four-way with these guys, to close SummerSlam, and you put a elimination-style stipulation to that, that could have the makings of a fucking all-out war like we've never seen in WWE. And I hope that WWE is thinking that same thing. Because the storylines and the elements are there. That's what I hope for. But with the ambulance match, I don't know if you guys felt the same way. I felt underwhelmed with the ambulance match. I felt completely underwhelmed. Their match um, that they had at Fastlane, and I believe their match at, uh, what was it, Payback? I thought those two matches were better than what we've seen tonight, even with the ambulance stipulation. The match was just, you know, what you would expect from Reigns and Strowman. Physical, they worked well together. There was a nice spot where where Strowman was taking chair shots from Roman Reigns, and he was not even selling the chair shots. He was eating chair shots. Like, Reigns didn't know what to do. They brawled up the ramp, and they teased the table spot with the announce table on the stage with Graves, Booker, and Michael Cole. That nothing happened there. But then they did the same spot that they did from Monday Night Raw, where Strowman threw Reigns into the ambulance that was parked on the stage. He bounced off it. He landed the same exact way like he did on Monday Night Raw, the same exact spot. There was also a spot where Strowman went into the LED screen on the stage and went right through it, broke right through it. That was being teased for like three weeks with not only Reigns and Strowman, but it was also teased with Joe and Lesnar. But it was, in fact, Reigns and Strowman who broke the LED board on the stage. That was a cool spot. But in the end of this thing, we had a tease by the back of the ambulance where Strowman took one of the backboards of the gurneys and started nailing Roman Reigns over the back with it several times. There was also a tease where Roman Reigns was Superman punching Braun Strowman and Braun Strowman was kind of half in the back of the ambulance and then half out. He was like teetering you know, going into the back of the ambulance, teetering on a loss. You know, a couple of Superman punches there, and Roman was on the verge of winning. He figured the Superman punch wasn't going to do it. He scaled back some, got a full head of steam, wanted to spear Strowman as he sat in the back of the ambulance, half in, half out. He wanted to spear Strowman into the ambulance with a huge exclamation point, but Braun Strowman was too quick. He moved. Roman Reigns went for a spear, and he speared himself right into the back of the ambulance. Braun Strowman slammed the door, and Roman Reigns lost the ambulance match. So, after that, Strowman banged on the ambulance to, for the ambulance to drive away. And then, all of a sudden, we got Strowman. He's getting his ass kicked. He gets thrown into the back of the ambulance. Roman Reigns gets into the driver's seat of the ambulance. He drives the ambulance into the loading dock area of the arena. He was about to drive out of the building. Roman Reigns had second thoughts. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. This guy won't go away. I can't get rid of this guy. I got to do something. And Roman Reigns says, I will take you to the fucking depths of hell if I have to. I will drive you to the depths of hell if I had to. He said it himself. And he actually lived up to his words. The ambulance, instead of driving out of the arena, Reigns backed the ambulance into one of the production trucks into one of the tail end of the production trucks that were backstage by the loading dock, and the half, the back half of the ambulance was crushed in with Braun Strowman in it. Now, clearly, he wasn't in it. They maneuvered the camera angles to the point where, you know, they showed Reigns, and they showed a visual of the camera looking at the rearview mirror, and Reigns looking just off into the distance, just pondering, should I do it, should I not do it? Which, obviously, you know, to all of us watching at home... You know, gave Braun Strowman enough time to just get out of the ambulance. And then Reigns did his thing. He backed the ambulance into the production truck. And then they did another shot away from the ambulance. It, it was uh, Kevin Dunn magic on Great Balls of Fire tonight. But the visual, the entire concept, the entire story that they played out 
was nicely done, but I think it was a little bit too much. It was overdone. Braun Strowman beat Roman Reigns, and in typical WWE fashion, you know, Braun Strowman didn't have any time to celebrate a huge victory over Roman Reigns. They made Roman Reigns look strong in defeat. Roman Reigns walked away from this ambulance match a loser, but he looked like the true winner tonight. Braun Strowman didn't look like a loser, um, even with all of this nonsense going on, because he did walk away on his own. But, again, where does that leave both Strowman and Reigns now? Strowman clearly fucked up tonight. I don't know how he's even going to be capable of fighting anybody for the next couple of weeks. Roman Reigns is a loser, right? He can't really come out and say anything about wanting a title shot. He just lost the match tonight. So, again, my fatal four-way idea is probably the best scenario to come out of everything that we've seen with these last two matches. Now, Roman Reigns... I understand you guys, you know, and, and, and I'm going to, I don't want to say it, and I'm, but I'm going to say it anyway. Guy's the most overprotected fucking wrestler in the entire WWE, possibly the history of the WWE. It's fucking nauseating. It really is nauseating. I can't fucking stand it, you know? Where was Vince McMahon when all this was going on? If this was such a big deal, where was Vince McMahon, you know? With the, the back of the ambulance, they got the fucking fire department coming in there and just trying to fucking, uh, you know, open the door with, like, I don't know what the, the jaws of life, I think they called it. It was a, a, an instrument, the jaws of life. They tried to pry open the door, and Braun Strowman's in there. You know, Kurt Angle was there. He's telling everybody to back away, stop taking pictures. They made a big deal out of it. They made a huge deal out of this, you know? And people are telling me, J.D., this looks like a double turn for Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman. Roman Reigns did a vile, evil thing to Braun Strowman, and Braun Strowman you know, walked away from this without asking for any medical help. He didn't want any medical help whatsoever. He told, pretty much told Kurt Angle to fuck off, you know? But I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that whatsoever. You got to understand, we've, we've cried for John Cena to turn heel for years, and nothing came of that. You think WWE is going, just going to willingly turn Roman Reigns heel on a great balls of fire pay-per-view? No. <laughs> There's no need for them to turn him heel, you know? At this point, it's too late. It's just too late to even bitch and cry about it. It's not going to happen. You're just going to have to accept the fact, I'm going to have to accept the fact that Reigns is going to be the current inception of what we see of him now. Nothing's going to change. You know, we have to live with that fact. But it wasn't no double turn. No double turn at all. Bro Strowman's going to continue to get the, the reaction that he gets when he fights Roman Reigns because nobody wants Roman Reigns. And Braun Strowman's going to get a positive reaction more so than a negative reaction because of the way he's been built. He's been built up as a monster. People are going to appreciate and respect the fact that this guy just got slammed in the back of an ambulance with half of the ambulance being crushed with him in it, and he walked away on his own, you know? Yeah, people are going to cheer that because people, by what they see, are going to see Strowman walking away on his own, and they're going to think, wow, this guy's fucking tough. This guy deserves our respect just based on that fact alone. But I thought it was well I thought it was well done but a, a little drawn out. It, it it was honestly ridiculous when I was first seeing it. It was really ridiculous. Like they made everybody look just a little bit more dumber with that entire segment. Honestly. Like all they had to do, they they made it as dramatic as fucking possible. It's not like the ambulance was fucking crushed to the point where they couldn't move the ambulance. All they had to do was move the ambulance a couple of feet up, get in the driver's seat, fucking put your foot on the gas pedal, and drive the motherfucker away from the production truck, and then go in the back of the ambulance and get Strowman out of there. They wanted to make it all dramatic as if the fucking ambulance was, like, destroyed. There was no saving this ambulance. They got the fucking fire department and an extra ambulance team to get the jaws of life to get Braun Strowman out of there. They made it just overly dramatic when it really didn't need to be, you know? Logic gaps, again, in WWE storytelling. They didn't have to go through all that, but they wanted to, to create an intriguing story. And it wasn't necessary. But again, where do they go from here? Where do they go from here? It's exactly what I talked about with the Fatal 4-Way. I think the Fatal 4-Way is presenting itself in the clearest way possible. And I think for SummerSlam, that is going to be the way that they go. Now, they could do a triple threat. You know, some people have told me, JD, maybe a triple threat. Maybe Lesnar, maybe Roman, maybe Joe. But then where does Strowman fit in? 
You're not going to have Strowman beat Roman Reigns in an ambulance match and not put him in a world championship match. It's going to be a fatal four-way. And if I predict that correct, by all means, I don't have any inside information. I'm just telling you from what I see what makes the most sense. So let me know what you guys are thinking about that. The top two matches on this show, yes, they delivered. Yes, it was at some points over dramatic, not needed. You know, there was the F5 situation with the main event and Lesnar pinning Samoa Joe clean with one F5. But the majority of what we've seen was positive. The majority of what we've seen is a nice progression towards SummerSlam. The majority of what we've seen entertained. But in typical WWE fashion, Nothing is ever perfect, and there's always shit to be critical about. And that's what I'm here. I'm here to pick apart the stuff that really doesn't make sense, and I'm here to make sense of it to you guys. But the, the last two matches of the show, they delivered, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Those are the two matches we waited for, and they really did make the show, you know, better than it was. For the rest of the show, yes, there were highlights. It wasn't a complete thumbs-down show. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. It wasn't a complete thumbs-down show. I'm not coming on here to rip the show because there was some good elements of this show. There were elements of this show that I actually enjoyed. Okay? Bray Wyatt and Seth Rollins. A decent opener. I didn't expect Bray Wyatt to get the victory here over Seth Rollins. I thought Seth Rollins being the cover star for WW2K18, they were going to push him. I thought Seth Rollins being pretty much the MVP of Monday Night Raw. In between those ropes, he's been the best wrestler bell-to-bell -bell since WrestleMania. And Seth Rollins, to me, he's developed a nice string of wins. He's got some momentum underneath him that I, I felt like Rollins eventually was going to be granted a world championship match sooner rather than later. But giving Bray Wyatt a victory, what does it really do? What does it really do for Bray Wyatt? Yeah, he needs a win. Corey Graves even said this is a must win for Bray Wyatt, you know? But what does it do for Bray Wyatt? It's not like it's going to take Bray Wyatt to the next step. It's not like it's going to grant Bray Wyatt you know, uh, a title shot or inch him closer to a title shot, it's not going to do anything. He got a win over Seth Rollins. What does it mean? It means nothing. He beat Seth Rollins, and it goes nowhere. Meanwhile, I felt like this would have been more for Seth Rollins. It would have been more beneficial for Seth Rollins to beat Bray Wyatt than the other way around. At least Rollins would have took that victory and said, you know what, I beat you, Bray. Let's move on to something else. But right now, it looks like these two guys are going to take this going into SummerSlam. And I still don't know what they're fighting over. I don't know what they're fighting over. Match went 12 minutes. It was a solid opener. You know, it was a well-fought match. But like I said, I don't know why they're fighting. And I don't know why Bray Wyatt needed a win. It's not going to do anything for him. Rollins is the one with the momentum. It would have made more sense for Rollins to get the victory. But Bray Wyatt wins. Bray Wyatt wins with his sister Abigail, one, two, three. And that was it. Bray Wyatt wins the opening match against Seth Rollins. Enzo and Big Cass. This was something that a lot of people figured would be a squash. It was a squash, but it was a calculated squash. It was a squash that went five minutes, and it didn't need to go five minutes. They could have cut four minutes off this squash and really made it just one, two, three, and we could have added at least two or three minutes, four minutes, to the Joe Lesnar match. This really didn't do anything for me. At all. Big Cass wins in five minutes. And Cass did come out with new music. It was pretty generic. It was pretty boring. I didn't like it at first At first listen. I'm going to have to go back and listen to, again, uh, listen to it again on YouTube when it's available by CFO. So I don't know what's going on with that. I don't want to jump on it and say it's shit already. But he did get new graphics. He got new tights. He's got new lettering, he's got a new logo, he's got new music. I'm not feeling it right now. I'm not really feeling anything from Big Cass right now. Because I'm still in the boat of, these guys shouldn't have been broken up. I think Big Cass right now is going to be a small fish in a very, very large pond that is Monday Night Raw. He's not going to fit into any plans. I don't know what plans he's going to fit into. You know? WWE has been all over breaking teams up for whatever reason. And I mentioned this on Off The Script. It's fine if you're going to break teams up if you got a plan, you know, to replenish the tag team division. And there are rumors going around that WWE is possibly thinking about doing a tag team tournament on the network next year. And that would be fantastic. And then that would make a lot more sense as to why WWE's breaking up all these teams. Golden Truth broken up. You got Rhino and Slater that really aren't together anymore. 
Enzo and Cass broke up. How long do you think the Hardys are going to be together before they become broken? Which I'll talk about in a second. You know, on SmackDown, you got you got American Alpha fighting singles. You got Jordan and Gable fighting singles. The Colognes are going to be out. I believe Epico has a fucking knee injury. You got uh, the Hype Bros, Zack Ryder, Mojo Raleigh. They're teasing a split up. It's like WWE's breaking up teams in 2017. That's their fucking, uh, their motto. That's their objective this year, to break up as many tag teams as possible. There's got to be a reason why. That's one of their weakest, that's one of their weakest things right now. It's one of the weakest parts of both brands, the tag team division. But you're willing to, willing, willingly, can't get it out, willingly breaking up these teams. And I don't understand why. So there has to be a reason. And there's no reason for Enzo and Cass to break up. And Cass and Enzo and this match proved me right. The only thing that I've seen in five minutes of this match is that this should not be. And the other thing that I'm thinking about, by watching these two guys go one-on-one instead of being a team, this is the personification. This is the definition of how you take NXT talent and bring them to the main roster and you don't know what the fuck to do with them. This is the NXT project that Triple H is so fucking frustrated by. Because God knows how much input he has on Monday Night Raw. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what Enzo or Big Cass are thinking. But this, to me, is just the downward spiral of what NXT talent is on Monday Night Raw. This right here. This should not be. Big Cass and Enzo should still be a team. This is way too soon. Cass is not going to go anywhere for a long time as a singles guy. You're going to leave Enzo pretty much with nothing to do. Where is he going to go? What is he going to do? Who is he going to feud with? These guys are more valuable together than they are apart right now. And nobody seems to understand that in WWE. So why? If you don't have any plans right now for Big Cass that are big plans, if you don't plan to push him like a fucking diesel, like, like a Kevin Nash when he broke away from Shawn Michaels, then what is the point? What is the point? There is none. Cass wins in five minutes, and he beat him with a big boot. That's it. The breakup didn't need to happen. He's going to get a big heel push. Where? I don't know. What's going to happen to Enzo? They continue to hype Enzo up as a fighter, as a scrappy fighter, as an underdog who never gives up. But where is he going to go? What are you going to do with him? What is the plan for Enzo? There is none, right? And again... The music, the logo, the new tights, the new attitude, you got to grow into it. I'm not going to be accepting of this right away at all because I'm still in that boat of these guys shouldn't have broke up. And I'm going to stick to that. Unless they change their mind, unless they change my mind, I'm going to stick to that. And that was it. It was a squash, but it should have been a lot quicker than what it was. It was five minutes and it was five minutes too long. Enzo loses to Cass, big boot, one, two, three. The Hardys and Sheamus and Cesaro. This was a 30-minute Iron Man match. And a feud that, to me, I am over and done with. I am well past this feud. Going into this, there were rumors of Sheamus and Cesaro, uh, you know, possibly splitting up. There was rumors that Sheamus is going to be out for an extended period of time filming a movie with Josh Dumel of Transformers and that they could possibly be dropping the titles back to the Hardys. That didn't happen tonight. And they made it very dramatic. This match went 30 minutes, and the only fucking... The only time of this match that was of any importance was the last 10 minutes. If you gave me the last 10 minutes, and that's all i seen of this match, it would have been a great fucking match. The first 20 minutes did absolutely nothing for me. I wanted to close my eyes, shut the stream off, and I wanted to go lay down and go to sleep. The last 10 minutes of this match were great, and it built on the drama of the 30-minute Iron Man match. We had Sheamus and Cesaro take a quick 1-0 lead, right? It was one of them fucking psych-out moves that led to Sheamus bro-kicking Matt Hardy. And it was a quick 1-2-3, uh, which led to a 1-0 lead. And then Cesaro and Sheamus went up 2-0, and that scored a second pinfall. They beat on Jeff for, for 10 minutes, methodically, and eventually that led to Sheamus and Cesaro going up to nothing. Matt eventually got the hot tag, Jeff recovered, and they both landed poetry in motion. Matt then hit the side effect, Jeff then hit the twist of fate, counted 1-2-3 at 13 minutes, and they pinned Cesaro. 
So now they're up 2-1, Se- uh, Sheamus and Cesaro. So then Cesaro and Sheamus went up 3-1 because Cesaro threw Matt into the ring post and Matt got counted out. So now Sheamus and Cesaro up 3-1. Then Sheamus and Cesaro, you know, were all over the Hardys. Cesaro had Matt in a sharpshooter. Jeff broke that up. Sheamus ran over, yanked Jeff off the ring apron. A couple minutes later, Matt tagged in Jeff, who dropped his legs onto Cesaro as he was rolled onto his back and scored the leverage pin at 23 minutes. So that was great. It was like a backslide into a leverage pin. Jeff Hardy did that that leg drop move that he usually does, and it pinned, uh, I believe, Cesaro's shoulders down to the mat. Beautiful move. One, two, three. So now we're up 3-2. So we tied it eventually 3-3 when Matt gave Sheamus a twist of fate off the top rope for the pin. So now we're 3-3. Now this is where things got crazy, man. Booker T, you know, was saying that this is like a best of seven and all in one night. Uh, The referee was checking on Sheamus at this point. Um, It just broke down. Jeff dove onto Sheamus and Cesaro. Matt and Jeff leaped off the fucking top rope together with a leg drop and a cross body block or a big splash by Matt Hardy, which eventually busted open Matt. He had a huge gash above his right eye. And at this point, Cesaro came in to make the save. Now, this is where I got confused because Cesaro wasn't the legal man, and I don't remember seeing a tag. He broke that double team move up on Sheamus, but he broke up the tag. So then... It was a series of near falls. Matt blind tagged in Jeff, landed a swanton, but Cesaro ran in and snuck the pin on Jeff with 27 seconds left. Now, I might have been a goon. I didn't see Cesaro tagging Sheamus at this point. I must have been looking at the chat on the stream. But Cesaro got the quick pin, and then after that, rolled out of the ring. Jeff was chasing Cesaro around the ring, which was smart on the champion's behalf. Jeff caught him eventually, threw him in the ring, hit the twist of fate with like one second left. But before that, the buzzer went off. And before you knew it, it was too late. It was 4-3. 30 minutes and Cesaro and Sheamus win 4-3. Like I said, the last 10 minutes of this match is all you needed. The first 10, 15 minutes was very lethargic. It was very just slow. The crowd wasn't into it. And then when we got close with the drama drawing near, that's when the crowd really started to get into it. And it became a really, really good tag team title match. But again, where do they go from here? Where, where do the Hardys go from here now? They they got this rematch because of what happened on Monday Night Raw. The best two out of three falls le- you know, ended in a draw. And now we have them be granted a 30-minute Iron Man match. The first team to gain the most pinfalls is the winner. And they lose. They lose in fair fashion. So what does this mean? The Hardys don't get another title shot. Does this mean that the Hardys are going to have to dig deep and just become something else to defeat Sheamus and Cesaro? Will this lead to Matt and Jeff becoming the broken Hardys? You got to think about it. You got to think you got to think that way because there are no other babyface teams in the division on Monday Night Raw. There's not. Rhino and Slater aren't getting a tag team title shot. You got the Revival and then you got the the club. You're not going to book Sheamus and Cesaro against the club. You're not going to book Sheamus and Cesaro against the Revival. Those are two heel teams. You're not going to have heel team versus heel team. So you're probably looking at and I can only hope, fingers crossed, that the Hardys are going to become the Broken Hardys, you know, dig down deep become something else, and beat these guys, and then Sheamus can go on to film his movie. And then we can get the Broken Hardys versus the Revival at SummerSlam. Because that's what I'm sticking to. I think that's going to be the tag team title match going into SummerSlam. And that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Alexa Bliss versus Sasha Banks, Raw Women's title match. This was actually very good. This was actually very, very good. And a lot of people were disappointed in the ending. And I'm trying to tell people, there's nothing to be disappointed here with the ending. Alexa Bliss loses, retains the title, because Sasha Banks won the account out. What else did you want to happen? What else did you want to happen here? You know? This is the product of WWE booking this shit on the fly. This is the product of WWE giving us a women's championship match that was put together in two weeks. Did you really expect Alexa Bliss to lose the title in this one-and-done situation? Of course not. This is going to carry over into SummerSlam. 
And that's why I don't like the way WWE books their shit like this. There was no way Sasha Banks was going to win the title clean. It didn't make any sense. The only thing that made sense here was for Alexa Bliss to keep the title. So she wasn't going to pin Sasha Banks clean because if she pinned Sasha Banks clean, then Sasha Banks should not be granted another match. Of course there was going to be a fucking fuck finish here. The only thing here was for Alexa to keep the title and Sasha to win via a DQ, via a count out. And that was the only thing that was even possible here. And that's exactly what happened. Sasha Banks won via count out so that she can pretty much say, you know what? Alexa took the cheap way out. She was a coward and let the referee count her out on purpose. She retained the title and it wasn't fair. I want another match. That's the only thing that makes sense here. So you guys are like, oh, the finish is fucking lame. Sasha Banks should have won. What do you expect when the feud is only two weeks old? If Banks lost clean and Alexa retained the title clean, Banks wouldn't be granted a rematch. And then we'd have to start this entire process over again and find a new number one contender. And these two actually had a very good match. And with what they did tonight, I wouldn't mind seeing this again. I wouldn't mind seeing this again. And who knows if Nia Jax is going to get involved. Because Nia Jax has been, you know, building a nice string of momentum for herself as well. Going into SummerSlam. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do. We're going to get Banks. We're going to get Bliss. We might get Nia Jax added because she and Alexa have had uh, a little dynamic going on. And coming out of that gauntlet match, there's no way you're not going to give Nia Jax an opportunity. You know, she, you're not, you're not going to not give her an opportunity to get a, a championship match at SummerSlam. She deserves one. She deserves one. This was the only thing that made sense here. Sasha Banks wins by countout, and that was the only way to go here. After the match, they fought on the stage. Banks leaped off the announce desk with her double knees, took a nasty bump. It looked like it looked like Sasha Banks uh, got. Alexa Bliss's nose, and Alexa was uh, bleeding from the nose into her mouth. So it was a very physical match towards the end, a very good match for 12 minutes with Alexa retaining via countout. Banks wins via countout, and the brawl after the match just solidified what I'm talking about. It's going to continue on into SummerSlam. Miz with Maurice, Bo Dallas, and Curtis Axel versus Dean Ambrose for the Intercontinental Championship. I did not give a flying fuck about this whatsoever, man. I did not care about this whatsoever. The crowd was dead. I'm sick of this feud. I'm sick of these two going one-on-one. -on -one. This has to be the end. It has to be the end. And I'll tell you this, man, because this is the last thing on this show. This is the last thing on this show. The Miz... And Dean Ambrose, ever since they came over from SmackDown, their stock has dropped considerably. And that sucks that I'm saying that about The Miz, because The Miz on SmackDown was probably their number one. If you look back at what SmackDown did post-draft, and you see the guys that stepped up, The Miz is up there with the AJ Styles and the Bray Wyatts and the Randy Ortons and all that good shit that was happening right after the draft. The Miz was up there. The Miz took the Intercontinental Championship and he made it fucking important. The matches that he put on with Dolph Ziggler were some of the best of 2016. The Miz in 2017 has lost so much momentum, his stock has dropped to a point where I just don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. And now, he's got Maurice. Maurice has been nothing but great for The Miz, but now they're adding Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel, which is great for those guys. It gets them on television, it puts them alongside the Intercontinental Champion and in front of more eyes. That's fantastic. But the fact is, the same shit happens every single fucking time. And I understand this is his character, and I understand this is the heel that he's playing, but how many fucking times do we have to see outside interference lead to the Miz winning or lead to the Miz retaining the Intercontinental Championship. It's the same old tired song and dance. It's the same fucking shit. And it's tiresome. I am tired of it. I don't even want the Miz with the Intercontinental Championship anymore, let alone fucking fighting Dean Ambrose for the title. I'm over it. The Intercontinental Championship needs to be put on a babyface. And I'm not talking Dean Ambrose. What I pitch for SummerSlam... And conspicuous by his absence here, there was no Finn Balor on this show. Finn Balor was not booked for Great Balls of Fire, which is bizarre to me, being that he's one of their best superstars. Not even Elias Sampson feud with, with Finn Balor even made this show. 
which I'm hoping is not turned into a SummerSlam match. That is a Raw match. Get it over with. It's a mini feud to keep him busy. Hopefully, they move Finn Balor onto something a little bit more important. Something a little bit more important that could become of Finn Balor is the Intercontinental Championship. I think Finn Balor versus The Miz for the Intercontinental Championship would do wonders for both men. It's something different for both men, and it would give Finn Balor the Intercontinental Championship, and it would get the IC title back on a babyface, which needs to happen. The IC title right now is dead. It's dead. This feud has killed the Intercontinental Championship. Get it back on a guy that you can consider a fighting champion. That belt is the, is the workhorse championship belt. Get it back on a babyface that's going to bring it back to prestige, that's going to work night in and night out and defend that title. The likelihood of us seeing the Intercontinental Championship in the main event of Monday Night Raw is greater with Finn Balor than it is with The Miz. You know, the idea of a Finn Balor feud with Seth Rollins or Bray Wyatt or anybody over the Intercontinental Championship is a lot more intriguing and a lot more interesting than with The Miz holding the Intercontinental Championship. It gives you more options as far as opponents go with Finn Balor than if you have it with The Miz. This is why I've been lobbying for Finn Balor and The Miz at SummerSlam, being that they're not going to be, you know, in anything else. Miz isn't going to be in anything else. There's no other opponent for him, right? There's no other babyface on the roster that, that could tie up the Miz going into SummerSlam. You're, what, are you going to have Dean Ambrose and Miz again at SummerSlam? Give somebody else a shot. Let's give Balor a shot. And the fresh matchups that could come to be with a babyface Balor as Intercontinental Championship actually presents a nice little situation for the Intercontinental Championship. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know how you guys feel, but right now, the IC title feud, the IC title situation on Monday Night Raw is not even remotely interesting right now. Ambrose sucks. He is fucking dead to me right now. Absolutely boring. They need to do something with this guy and fast. Nothing about Ambrose remotely interests me whatsoever. And the same thing, sadly, is happening to The Miz. He was great with just Maurice on, on, on SmackDown. Now he's got Maurice on Monday Night Raw, and you add Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel, and it's just like, come on, bro. How many opportunities is this guy going to have to cheat to win? Not only does it make The Miz look the fucking same each time, stale and just generic and the same old shit, but it's not really doing anything for the Intercontinental Championship either. It's actually making it less and less prestigious. That's just me. But The Miz beats Dean Ambrose here with... Outside interference from Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel in 11 minutes. Skull-crushing finale for the win. Nothing out of the ordinary. If you've seen one match between these between these two, you've seen them all. And that was it. And that was Great Balls of Fire, man. There was a lot on this show that actually was very good. Some of the things really didn't make sense. Some of the things I got to call them out on, you know. But for a first inaugural Great Balls of Fire, it wasn't a thumbs-down show. If I was to gauge this on a thumbs down, thumbs up ratio, I would say that this was the thumbs up show. Joe, Lesnar, Reigns, Strowman, the whole ambulance situation, the last 10 minutes of that tag team title match. You had uh, the opening match with Bray Wyatt and Seth Rollins, Alexa Bliss and Sha Sasha Banks. There was, there was some good stuff on this show. It wasn't all bad, but... WWE has a lot of open-ended situations here. They have the opportunity to make SummerSlam really special. Will they take that and make it special? Give me something different going into SummerSlam. This is your opportunity now. Raw, we, we, we are no more with Raw pay-per-views until SummerSlam. This is what we got. We got literally four weeks. There's six weeks till SummerSlam. Six weeks till SummerSlam. If they can't present anything fresh to me in six weeks, then it's just downright laziness. Downright laziness. You got six weeks till SummerSlam to create something different. Do it. Get away from this stale bullshit, the same old safe generic bullshit. Give me something different for SummerSlam instead of being safe with the same old feuds. I hope WWE goes into SummerSlam with a plan because it could really... It could really come out being great on both ends, on Raw and on SmackDown. On SmackDown, it's a little bit more easier. It's a little more cut and dry. It's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, you can see what's going on. On Monday Night Raw, you really can't tell what's going on. You don't know what's going on. And that just goes to show you how confusing Monday Night Raw is week in and week out. They don't know what they're doing. And in turn, we don't know where they're going because we don't know what the fuck they're doing. And they don't know what they're doing. So, I hope they have a plan. 
And I hope everything on Monday Night Raw side comes out to make sense. It certainly can make sense if they put the fucking thought behind it. I just hope they don't get lazy. But Great Balls of Fire was a thumbs up show. It wasn't a thumbs down show. There was a lot to like. There was some to dislike, as always, with a Raw branded pay-per-view. But in the end, it was a thumbs up show. And if you enjoyed the review, let me know what you guys think down below. I will be back with Monday Night Raw review, as always. And until then, thank you guys so very much for everything that you guys did for me. Thank you to everybody that donated to the Twitch stream. Thank you to everybody that came out to the Twitch stream. I'll see you guys tomorrow with more great WWE content. Thank you guys so much. Until then, hit that thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. And hit that subscribe button down below for more great WWE news and rumors. I am JD. Have a good night. And I'll see you all tomorrow for Monday Night Raw.